Our efforts to significantly decrease the use of fossil raw material puts high pressure on developing sustainable alternatives. And this means putting to use all the potential side streams, byproducts or waste streams that are generated from renewable sources. Everything that is created in nature has a counterpart that can degrade and recycle those carbon-rich molecules. Here, biotechnology offers immense opportunities. Using biotechnology, we can combine in novel ways activities found in nature to consume pretty much any organic compound found on this planet. Or, at the same time, we can create new compounds and new materials. In nature itself, it depends on the organisms what their capabilities are in dealing with the waste. If we have molds and mushrooms, so they are very good at utilizing heterogeneous organic material, like, like sawdust is there, different plant materials. If then uh, we have yeasts, they very much like sugar, so we know that, uh, that you can produce ethanol from sugar with yeasts. Uh, and they are not so good at very, uh, very complex uh, materials like the fungi. Then, which is beautiful, also biological organisms can utilize simple carbon sources as CO2 and, and convert them further. And in addition to sunlight, you can also use hydrogen to convert CO2 uh, into the, in the metabolism of the organisms. So from these raw materials, which are waste fractions, uh, you can then build in the metabolism of the cells very elaborate and, and, and complex and very functional components which form the cells of different types of chemistries from carbohydrate, lipids, proteins, pigments, uh, molecular motors, sensor molecules and so on. So the capabilities are enormous. And all this is, of course, catalyzed by enzymes that the cells create. Ideally, we need to use this power to turn all our waste streams into materials that need a carbon source, instead of taking that carbon from fossil raw materials. And this is how we see the future biorefineries, a combination of processes all optimized for the maximum utilization of natural, recyclable or non-fossil carbon sources. Today we're going to look at many examples of this in various applications and various stages of research, from fundamental findings to demonstration or pilot scale-ups. Our first case example comes from ST1, the Finnish bioethanol producing company, who took a bold step forward to produce their own enzymes needed in the bioethanol production from lignocellulosic waste streams. Bioprocesses are have actually been familiar to us for 15 years since we have been an ethanol producer for a long time with, from bio waste. So in that sense, producing valuable chemicals from, with, with bioprocesses was familiar, a familiar thought to us. And, and we figured that uh, enzyme production is really not that different from ethanol production. So you take sugars, you take a carbon source, you take a nitrogen source, and then you get the product that you want. So in that sense, uh, including a, yet another bioprocess to our biorefinery seemed to be quite a natural thought. Producing your own enzymes has clear benefits. It's mostly to do with the price of enzymes. So it is one of the top three uh, costs when producing 2G ethanol out of softwood biomass. The plans are to include the on-site enzyme production in a future commercial scale ST1 cellulonics biorefinery. We have the cellulonics process, uh, which first has the pretreatment of the softwood sawdust, and after that we have enzymatic hydrolysis, and after that we do a fermentation and, and distill the ethanol from the process. In addition to ethanol, we also have other bioproducts from the refinery, for example, an organic grade fertilizer, and, and also lignin, which, which is currently burned, but a lot of research is carried out in order to valorize it further. And into this uh, biorefinery in the future, we're ho hoping to include an enzyme production unit, which will preferably utilize some of the streams from the main process as, as carbon source and produce the enzymes to be used in the hydrolysis step. If you make your own enzyme, you can uh, reduce costs uh, involved in transport 
in, in stabilization of the commercial enzyme products. Uh, you are not dependent on uh, third parties, let's say, so in, in, in your in a process development. But there is also like a more technical part in here. So the biomasses and the pretreatment conditions produce very different kind of materials. And, and the, there are only like limited amount of commercial products available for this purpose. And uh, if you think uh, the chemistry of the pre uh, biomasses that should be depolymerized by the enzymes basically in that process, uh, can vary very much between different uh, biomasses and also different uh, processes. So the one solution is not okay for every purpose. And uh, for that reason, that was the second reason why they wanted to have an own enzyme product, which would be optimized for their, their system. But why use enzymes and not acids to treat the lignocellulose? Enzymes are biological catalysts which are very specific. Uh, they, are, they can operate in mild conditions, which is very nice. They don't produce any side products because they are specific, compared to, for example, acid hydrolysis. In this enzymatic uh, hydrolysis step, the requirement is that you convert as much of the cellulose and hemicellulose into monosaccharides as possible, so that the yield of the hydrolysis process is high, and you don't, uh, there is no residual polysaccharides, basically, in, after, the, uh, after the hydrolysis. What was the main challenge in the polymerization of the lignocellulose? There is a need to have a many different kinds of enzymes and the composition of the enzymes uh, optimal for different biomasses is different in each case. And for that reason there is a need to uh, optimize the enzyme mixture for different biomasses and bio, uh, pretreatment conditions because the substrate of the enzymes is different in each case. And for the enzyme mixture optimization, we usually do so that we first take a screen from VTT's collection and the enzyme mixtures produced by the VTT's uh, fungal strains and test these mixtures in the hydrolysis first in conditions mimicking the process as close as possible. And from these mixtures, we select the best ones for the continuation. Uh, after that, what we do is that uh, we add in this base, sort of baseline enzyme mixtures new enzyme components, which can, for example, hydrolyze oligosaccharides or attack on the crystalline cellulose or act, attack on the more amorphous parts of the cellulose and, and, or, or attack on hemicellulose, depending on what kind of biomass is there in process design. And by these kind of de-bottlenecking experiments, we, we identify that what enzyme components we need to add in this baseline enzyme mixture so that the hydrolysis yield will improve. I'd like to ask Maria, how can synthetic biology be applied in this type of enzyme research? So first of all, we can, um, we can um, for instance, change the properties of the enzymes. So we can use so-called protein engineering, uh, where we can um, alter the amino acid structure, and thus we can improve, for instance, the pH tolerance or the temperature tolerance. We can also put up sort of directed evolution, where we have had the Nobel Prize winner, Francis Arnold, uh, and the Millennium Prize winner here in Finland to, to, to obtain the pri prize for. So this is a field which has been there for a long time. Then another thing which is important um, in particular for the, this ST1 project as well is that when one is looking for new enzymes, just taking the genes and, and then putting them into uh, the production organisms like trichoderma. So uh, the problem is that trichoderma naturally produce uh, hundreds a huge amount of enzymes, which activity impairs or is problematic if you want to analyze the activity of a, of a new enzyme candidate. And now then, with synthetic biology, we have been able to make, design synthetic promoters uh, which drive expression of the enzymes in conditions where the other enzymes, the natural enzymes, are not uh, expressed. 
and thus you get a pure enzyme. And you can also do this in a high throughput manner, so you throw the genes in under this synthetic promoter and then you take the, the, the fungus then secretes the enzymes and then you can measure the, the activity individually of a large number of, of, uh, of fungal clones, each producing a specific new novel enzyme. Typically, the like starting point of the uh, in this uh, enzyme mixture development, the hydrolysis yields can be around 60 percent or 50 percent, 60 to 50 percent. But, but by the, this optimization process, uh, we usually can achieve tens of percent improvement in the hydrolysis yield. For the, this depodlenecking or screening of needed enzyme activities, we use VTT's own enzyme collection. We have a range of different kind of uh, hydrolytic and oxidative enzymes, which can improve the hydrolysis or overall depolymerization of the, uh, the lignocellulose cellulose polysaccharides. But we are not only relying on the existing enzymes. So, um, for example, in this ST1 case, we have utilized the enormous amount of sequencing data, fungal genome sequencing data that is available in the world. So that has opened up a, a, like a, a totally new type of insight into the genomes of uh, fungi and the genetic diversity of the enzymes that uh, act on the on this lignocellulose hydrolysis or depolymerization. We also at VTT have our own databases. We are not relying only on the public ones. These are generated in such way that we cultivate the different types of fungi on different types of lignocelluloses, which, and when the, these fungi grow in this kind of lignocellulose, containing media, they start to produce or express genes which they need for, to be able to grow in these conditions. And after that, we isolate the RNA from these fungi and sequence it. And then we can find out what genes the fungi actually has expressed in these conditions and what enzymes these genes encode. And, and in that way, we can uh, select from this sort of transcriptomes, the uh, enzyme genes, which are good candidates for the improvement of hydrolysis of that kind of lignocellulose. And these genes are then transferred to this uh, industrial production host. So if you want to produce enzymes industrially, you have to bring the natural genes into an industrial production host. Otherwise, they are not available for, for any process. Uh, at VTT, we typically use this trigonal resay strains, uh, which uh, have a capacity of producing like 50 to 100 grams per liter of protein uh, in, in, in bioreactor conditions. How we usually do it, so, uh, for example, in this SD1 case, we had a good baseline starting strain. We put the new genes out from the, uh, which were found in the, in the genome screening approach and make a new uh, engineered trichoderma strains which have these new enzymes and in that way improve the enzyme mixture that the uh, fungus produces. The genetically modified fungal strain has superior hydrolytic capabilities. The new enzymes what we uh, introduced in, in this system, so uh, typically by uh, adding two to four enzymes, new enzyme genes, you can improve by good selection, you can improve the hydrolysis yield, like, or to 90 percent, depending on the biomass type. In nature, trees would remain for thousands of years if it weren't for the degrading fungi and the numerous enzymes they produce. Lignocellulose is extremely complex, and I think nobody even now knows what all enzymes are involved in the. Uh, degradation in the nature. And if you think about what, how many different kinds of microbe, microbes uh, are involved in 
biomass degradation in nature. So the, the, the range is enormous. Even in, within one enzyme class, like I have a xylanase which hydrolyzes linkages in, in xylan backbone. So in, even in that class there are like very many different types of variants. Some operate with have different properties or the catalytic activity is basically the same but they can have different pH range, temperature range, um, other properties uh, which are important to understand in this uh, industrial uh, enzymatic hydrolysis. Uh, about these new enzymes, uh, I think one of the significant findings in, well, relatively near future was discovery of this cellulose oxidizing or polysaccharide oxidizing enzymes, LPMOs, lytic polysaccharide monooxygenases, which uh, had this remarkable ac ability to increase the hydrolysis when they are introduced into a mixture containing uh, co common hydrolytic cellulitic enzymes. So I think that is a good example how even in, in this quite no modern, modern days we have found new enzymes which are s extremely significant in, in this lignocellulose hydrolysis. The oxidizing enzymes originally discovered by Professor Vincent Eysink are currently a hot topic in enzyme research. But how do they differ from cellulases? So what LPMOs do, they attack on the, in the cellulose polymer and they attack, can attack on the crystalline parts so that they cut the, create like uh, defects in the cr cellulose crystals and in the, so that the, uh, the other enzymes can access those better. And, um, and the difference between uh, LPMOs and cellulases is that there are cellulases uh, which attack on crystalline cellulose, but they start from the chain ends. So they don't cut the uh, uh, crystals inside. Uh, there are enzymes which are able to hydrolyze cellulose within the cellulose chains, but those are not active on cellulose crystals. So these are specific enzymes for creating nicks inside the crystals so that the, for example, other enzymes called cellobiohydrolysis can start hydrolyzing the crystals more efficiently. And the cellulose crystals are the most recalcitrant uh, parts of the cellulose or polysaccharides within the lignocellulose basically. The future ST1 biorefinery might even have different main products. I, actually, I find it quite possible that in the future um, we have a biorefinery that produces ethanol but the main, main product is actually something completely different. If, if you look at the oil distillation kind of curve and, and the stuff that you get from the oil, oil refining process, there are a lot of other components to be replaced with non-fossil uh, fossil pro products as well. So it's not only the liquid fuels, it's also the, uh, also the different kind of polymeric materials and stuff like that, that you, can, that you are able to produce while producing, for example, ethanol. So in that sense, if we get a great value from, from for example, our lignin, I don't see it as impossible that we have at some point a lignin refinery that produces ethanol as well.